Hello, and welcome to the Moss Adams webcast of Public or Private, Think COSO 2013 for Internal Controls. Before we get started, we have just a few housekeeping items we'd like to cover to improve your webinar session. Moss Adams is pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize both how you view our presentation and how you interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. For example, you can click the file folder icon to download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by clicking Q&A in the bottom left-hand portion of the icon bar and typing in your question. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. We'll ask polling questions throughout today's presentation. Per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy webcast CPE standards, CPE credit will be awarded based on your participation in these polls. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. If you're attending this webcast in a group, in order to receive CPE credit, you must complete our attendance sheet available in the file folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Please have all group members sign the sheet and please remit only one sheet per group. Also note, today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and is not available to participants who view the on-demand version. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon to open a PDF file you can save to your computer. We'll email a copy of your PDF certificate in two weeks if you can't download it today. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. So here at Moss Adams, we've asked our professionals, Weston Nelson and Colin Wallace, to present today. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about them. So Weston has led global compliance practice and strategy for multinational companies in the Fortune 100, Big Four, and regional public accounting environments. He began his career with a Big Four firm and was most recently the global finance compliance director for Nike. Weston's risk management services include internal audits, Sarbanes-Oxley compliance, process and control analysis, IT compliance and strategy, IT governance, ERP solutions, and anti-bribery. Weston has provided financial compliance, internal control, and risk management services since 1996. Joining, Col joining Weston is Colin Wallace. Colin has over 14 years of relevant internal audit, SOX 404, SSAE 16, and forensic audit experience. He has organized and performed financial, operational, and compliance reviews throughout the United States and abroad. In this capacity, he has been involved with every aspect of the audit process, including the planning, analysis, reporting, and project management. In addition, Colin has managed numerous SOX 404 and SSAE 16 engagements from the initial planning to final reporting. He is an active member of the firm's technology, communications, and media group, and a leader of the firm's forensic and investigative services team. Welcome to our program, gentlemen. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, appreciate everyone joining us this morning uh, and extend a welcome to everyone. Uh, today we want to just spend a few minutes kind of uh, want to spend some few minutes talking about COSO. Uh, I know some of you may already know what it is, some may not. Uh, what I want to try and establish today is really uh, create an inter interactive environment. So as we're going through these slides, I uh, highly recommend that uh, if you have questions or you want to uh, pause for a minute, um, Send them through. Uh, I think you just uh, basically submit your questions through and we'll take them as we're going through each slide. With that, what we want to try and accomplish today 
is really to provide an overview, a quick overview of COSO, but then really spend more time focused on what the power of COSO can do for you within your organizations um, and how a lot of the new framework and the new principles that have been published can really help you establish um, the steps needed to run a program at various levels, whether that's other regulatory requirements, whether it's operational, or even financial reporting, again, extending this beyond Sarbanes-Oxley. So today's objectives really are to provide that overview, to walk through how to extend the framework beyond Sarbanes-Oxley, use a couple of real-world examples, and then spend a few minutes where we'll really go beyond COSO and the potential and how you can leverage the framework to accomplish other uh, objectives that you may have within your organizations. So with that, I think the next, the next slide, what we have here is a polling question, and that's really designed to set up the, help us understand the dynamics and your experience with COSO that will help us frame the conversation for the next hour. So take a few minutes and uh, sign into this polling question, and we'll come back to you in just a minute. Right, exactly. So which of the following best describes your organization? So are you a public company and you use COSO framework for your SOX compliance only? Or perhaps you're a public company and use the COSO framework for SOX and other compliance already? Perhaps you're a private company and are not familiar with COSO, or a private company and you use the COSO framework for your compliance needs already? Finally, you're a private company and are considering a framework for your internal controls and or compliance. And lastly, that perhaps this doesn't apply to you, uh, that your company does not meet any of the above criteria. So please select the radial button, the circle next to your answer, and press the submit button in order for your answer to be recorded. Throughout this presentation, we'll be asking a total of four polling questions you will need to answer a minimum of three to be eligible to receive CPE today. And I think Weston will give this maybe another five more seconds. Close the polls and we'll take a look at our results. Let's look at our results. All right, so we have a relatively even distribution. However, it looks like for about 28% of those individuals, it's not applicable. My company does not meet any of the above criteria. I've had a couple of comments come through that there might be some government agencies or government, government entities that are using COSO or that are on the line today. Looks like uh, about 21% are private companies considering using the framework and all the way down to 10% who are on the call that are public companies that uh, use the COSO framework for SOX compliance only. So not to spend any more time on this because uh, you can see the results on your screen. We want to go into some of the background of COSO just to, to set up the rest of the presentation and then we'll get into the, the real meat of the topics here in a few minutes. So what is COSO? The purpose of this slide is to illustrate that COSO didn't come from just one organization that said, you know, this is a good framework that should be used. It's actually five different organizations that came together to provide input to COSO as part of the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission that was organized back in 1985. So most of you will probably recognize at least one or more of the entities below, including the IMA the IIA and the AICPA being several of the more prominent ones. So in 1992, that the COSO Commission um, published Internal Control Integrated Framework, which was basically designed to help organizations better assess, design, manage their internal controls. And up until recently, this was the primary framework that was used by uh, public companies, governments um, in some cases, and um, private organizations as the 
the most widely accepted framework for internal controls. Now, in 2013, the COSO updated the framework to provide for changes in the industry since 1992, changes in technology to provide additional emphasis on fraud and IT general controls that uh, were really needed to bring COSO to the current age. So the, the question at the end, why update? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, true, the, the core principles of COSO weren't broken, but what it did is um, it provided more detail and more um, structure in which companies can um, assess their internal controls. So with that, and I mentioned this briefly, but it has the same COSO objectives. And if you're familiar with the COSO cube, these are the um, three items listed across the top of the cube, operations and reporting and compliance. And it also has the five components of internal control being the control environment, uh, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and monitoring activities. And it also has the same need for judgment um, as internal audit professionals. So what did change, however, and we'll go through here in the next couple of slides, is that it added 17 principles that um, basically lined up underneath each one of those components to provide um, additional information in which management could use to assess internal control. So in addition to those 17 principles, it also added points of focus, which um, could further define what the intent was behind those 17 principles in order to allow management to more clearly map their internal controls um, provide more granularity and to provide some examples as to what uh, COSO is really looking for with respect to addressing those 17 principles. This last graphic that I want to put up here on the screen is the five components on the left-hand side of the screen followed by the 17 principles that I had mentioned before. So prior to 2013, COSO outlined those five components, but it, other than um, a narrative description of what the control environment, risk assessment, et cetera, included, it didn't explicitly define what the expectation was in order to comply with COSO with respect to each one of those areas. So what the, the 17 principles does is it breaks down those components into um, 17 more granular areas that you could then focus your efforts and determine whether or not you were in, in compliance with that component. So one thing just to note here, as we're going through the presentation today, we're going to spend a lot of time going through each of the components and reviewing the principles. So if you have a, a printout of this or if you have something handy, uh, this may be a slide that you want to just keep off to the side because we'll reference this as we go through our discussion today. Um, and this is really the content of, this, of today's discussion is how you can leverage these principles beyond just what is typically um, referred to for COSO for Sarbanes-Oxley, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. All right, with that, we're going to move into the second of four polling questions. So if you missed the first one, you definitely need to uh, respond to this one and the following two as well. Tanya? Thank you. So which answer best completes this sentence? The COSO framework was updated in 2013 to, to increase management's understanding as to what constitutes effective internal control, to offer points of focus that support each principle, to provide detail and clarity on implementation, or all of the above. And as a reminder, for those of you just joining us, please be sure and select the radial button next to your answer and press the submit button in order for your answer to be recorded.
We'll give this maybe another three seconds and we'll close the poll. And we'll take a look at our results. Okay. No wrong answers there, Weston. Nope, nope. So looking at the results, uh, it looks like uh, most of you answered with all of the above. Uh, small percentages um, provide detail and clarity on implementation. Offer points of focus that support each principle was about 4%, and then to increase management's understanding as to what constituted effective internal control was another 3%. So. Uh, Pretty good. I mean, the the answer there and the intent was to um, provide all of the above, but certainly each one of those is a specific call out that the new framework was intended to add additional clarity to help establish or increase management's understanding of what constitutes an effective internal control and provide clarity around implementation. So, um, good good polling question to kind of set up the next step. When we think about COSO and why do we use COSO, um, as Colin mentioned, COSO has been out for a while, and certainly the Treadway Commission and the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations have been around for a while. Uh, it wasn't until 2002 when the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was um, basically required a framework. And there were several frameworks at the time that you could adopt, but as a result, most U.S. companies um, adopted the COSO framework. And so where we most prominently see the use of COSO today is really around Sarbanes-Oxley. That's when you think COSO, you think Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, and then in essence, basically SEC required companies to divulge in their annual report what management's responsibility was and the framework by which management was using, uh, which framework management was using to establish their internal controls. Another area where you see it commonly used is around um, JSOCs, uh, where they leverage a lot of the same concepts and principles as the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So with that, um, we're going to kind of spend some, we're not we're going to spend some today talking about other areas. Um, COSO was intended, and when you go through the COSO 2013 revision, um, it provides some very good principle-based discussions that you can have in setting up other regulatory initiatives. It's intended to cover off on not only regulatory, but operational. And so I want to just for a minute ask yourself, you know, what are all the issues or challenges or regulatory requirements that impact your business? And as we go through this, um, some of these may be applicable, some of these may not. And then we'll talk about some examples that will be probably, will be a applicable to everyone. So as we talk through this, we have, you know, many of you may have heard of the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, anti-bribery, anti-corruption. We have HIPAA, OCUP OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, can't leave them off, they're the most common, Dodd-Frank, cybersecurity, import-export custom regulations, privacy, and there are others that we can talk about. So when you sit down and you talk about those different aspects that may be impacting your business, when you slide back and you think about how do we put in a structure or a framework to address each of those initiatives, or those, whether it's a regulatory requirement, whether it's an operational requirement, or it's a financial requirement, what is it we can do to implement a framework or an approach to help set up and be successful within our organizations. And that's where, you know, based on my experience in working with several clients and, and through my experience, COSO really becomes the perfect solution or the obvious solution because it sets up a really good way to think through a specific example or an objective that you may have within your organization. And it helps you tie together all the components and how all those components interact and drive each of the principles that are underneath each of them. So what we're going to do for the next 15, 20 minutes is we're going to spend some time going through an example. And that example um, will help us kind of 
establish what are some of the benefits that can come out of COSO. If you think about standing up your organization and using COSO, one of the things that COSO does really well is it helps you or enables you to create policies and procedures. If you're following the principles, it can help you in defining roles and responsibilities. It'll help you in developing a consistent framework. And the nice thing about COSO is it really focuses on the risk elements unique to your business. So what is right for you? And no one client or no one industry or no one uh, business is going to be the same. This is where COSO, I think, the power in COSO really shines, is that risk assessment really develops out the opportunity or develops out the framework specific to your risks and needs. Um, COSO will also help you measure and improve performance. As you start to stand up, and we'll get to this towards the end of the slide, it'll help you in identifying where you have common controls and how you can create those controls in a way that will address more than just one regulatory requirement or one uh, operational requirement. And then it'll, have, in essence, really start to help you create an effective and efficient internal control framework. Um, and then at the end of it, you know, when you think through the COSO components, there's an element, you know, one of the components is monitoring. Well, that ultimately is really speaking to measurement or understanding the health or status of that specific objective you're trying to achieve. So these are the benefits. As we walk through, we'll, hopefully, we'll spend some time talking about how those benefits manifest themselves um, using this example. So let's start off with this example. We're going to take a real-world example that hopefully many of you um, are dealing with or considering, and that's the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act. And I'm not going to go through the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act in detail, but there's two elements that we want to highlight as our objectives as we think through this example. The first element is really the FCPA or the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act was uh, instituted into law to prohibit U.S. companies and their officers from offering anything of value to a foreign government official, foreign political party, or candidate. So in essence, trying to level the playing field and really make sure that there wasn't uh, any corrupt practices that would in unduly influence governments and their officials in siding with one business over another. The second part of the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, and this is the important piece as well, is that it requires that the organization or the business keep accurate records that reflect transactions and that there are proper internal controls in place to identify when certain events occur that would raise that attention level up to the appropriate people within the organization to review. So as we go through this example, keep in mind these two objectives or these two requirements. One is that we're trying to identify and prevent um, a payment going to a government official. The other is that we're trying to maintain internal controls and adequate records that accurately reflect the transactions and how we do our business. So with that said, I'm going to come back to the components of COSO. And we're going to start off with the first one. So if I had to summarize control environment, um, I would summarize control environment into these four points. Tone at the top knowledgeable ownership at a leadership level, roles and responsibilities, and commitment by the organization. So if we think about FCPA and what we're trying to um, accomplish, it really is, if those two objectives are in mind, then who do we assign within the organization that has that tone at the top, that is knowledgeable about this, and that can establish roles and responsibilities and commitment to the organization? So I want to pause there for a minute, and you guys can think about where you would go with this, and then we'll talk about some alternatives and examples as we go through this. Okay, so let's start with who is responsible and who should be responsible, or who should be responsible within the organization. Depending on your organization, this may vary. Um, ultimately, what you want to establish if we're thinking about FCPA, 
is that we want to establish someone that is knowledgeable, that understands the rules and regulations of FCPA, that is in a position that can drive at a senior leader or senior leadership level. Typically, a C-suite is the preferred location, um, but that's not always required. And that someone, this individual, is really ultimately responsible for driving and setting the tone within the organization. So if you think through and talk about, all right, how do we set up an internal control framework and we set up this for FCPA, it's really going through and taking each of these principles under, the, under each component and identifying how we're going to establish this within the organization. And for control environment, that really is speaking to setting up the tone at the top, knowledgeable person, roles and responsibilities, and commitment. Okay? Moving on to the next one. So if we now, if we're taking our FCPA example, the really the next important step in the organization is how do we define risk and against that stated objective, which is the FCPA or Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, how do we define and identify the risk of bribing a government official and maintaining accurate records? So where would you start? This is the part around COSO that for me is very exciting. This is where it really tailors in this is where it really tailors in the program unique to your business. So to start, really your intent is to go the intent would be to go through and perform a risk assessment that goes through and looks at all of the elements within your business and how that business interacts with government officials. So if you think about your business and what, you, what, what transactions you do, where would those likely locations occur? And we'll throw up a couple examples here. And this is specifically, you're looking at two elements. You're looking at where would we have an interaction with a government official, and in which of those locations would we need to then start developing internal controls to monitor those activities. So, first one that's most common if you're going through this, a lot of organizations focus a lot of their time around sales activities. So where is the sales generation happen? What are those activities and events and where do they and could they interact with the government official? So if you're doing new business within a new country, if you're doing new business within a, a new area or a new line, does that require any kind of government official sign-off? So it's really going through your organization and understanding where these likely touch points can exist and then documenting them and going through a risk assessment that would then highlight where that potential risk is and ranking it on a scale of one to five, typically is my experience where we've used this, to help you assess where those potential uh, government official touch points are. So I've got a number of other examples here that we can talk about. But the risk assessment is really designed with that specific objective to look at where those government official touch points can occur. And then from that, the next step is really moving into how to then I take each of those areas where we identified risk and link them into the control activities. So if you remember the second part of the FCPA or Foreign Corrupt Practice Act was to accurately record transactions and this is the end and have defined internal controls around each of those. As you think through these objectives, I'm just going to summarize the control activities to really define and develop specific activities that mitigate the risk to the achieved stated objective or objectives. And in this case, it's the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act. It's develop activities over not only the transactions themselves, but also over technology that may exist and assessing where those risks may occur. And then it's establishing policies and procedures to address each of those areas and define what activities should be done and how they should be organized or how they should be transacted. So I'm going to pause for a minute because I think we had a question that came in. And the question came in, um, do you have to purchase access to COSO framework to be able to see the detailed breakout of the, of the principles? 
The answer to that is no. Um, I think there's enough content out there that will help you see the principles. Um, actually purchasing the COSO methodology or framework, um, while it does give you a lot of examples in how to set that up, um, you don't necessarily have to see that to see the details from the principles. There's a lot of content out on the, um, on the Internet that will enable you to get a lot of that, including a lot of the points of focus that are under them. We also had another question come in that uh, was asking about, about responsibility and whether or not the board is ultimately the one that should be responsible for um, some of these areas like FCPA. So depending on your organization, yes, ultimately everything flows up to the board. Some organizations don't have a board, maybe they have a commission, maybe they have an, a committee that uh, is ultimately responsible. But uh, um, a lot of times the, the owner um, so to speak, that is um, tasked with rolling out a risk assessment or something of that nature wouldn't be the board. The board is um, providing the oversight and the monitoring, but they wouldn't be the ones that actually perform an FCPA risk assessment, for example. No, and that's a good question because, um, and this is getting to a point where you really want to have something or someone who's responsible for the stated objective that that is their full-time responsibility, right? So a lot of times I see that sitting within the legal department, uh, especially when we're talking about Foreign Corrupt Practice Act. So it's having someone who is in that group who has responsibility over the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act and roll out within the organization. Two really good questions. So quickly, coming back to, we just talked about risk assessment and how Really, the intent is to go through and define what your risks are related to your organization and identify where those potential touch points can occur with a government official. And then it's developing the control activities. So wherever you have stated risks, then this is how it links into the control activities. The control activities become that next step of how you develop your internal controls at a transactional level that will enable you to identify and detect when those occurrences happen. So specifically, if we talked about earlier the, the sales activity, um, a lot of areas ultimately when we think about Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, there has to be some type of payment of value that's made. So really it's going through and looking at your organization and understanding where all of those elements can exist whether it's procurement, travel agencies, thinking supply chain, right? You may have to get your product and raw materials in and out of customs. Uh, when you're brokering real estate deals, especially in foreign countries, you may be interacting with government officials. Depending on what locations you're in, sometimes um, if you're in Saudi Arabia or, or Russia or China or Japan, when you're interacting with a lot of these agencies, they are the government. So it's being aware of where all those instances occur and then specifically developing your internal controls to address those reviews specific to the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act. Another area where you can see a lot of this is petty cash, agents and brokers, gift policy, um, and then how you use technology in this is important. Um, that can help you significantly improve your ability to detect if there is an occurrence. Once you've established your control activities and you've designed your controls to specifically address, address those risks that you identified through your risk assessment, then you lead into your next step, which is information and communication. And this is how you start to stand up your program and move it forward. So this is where you begin to develop policies and procedures, which is an extension of the control activities. It's defining roles and responsibilities. It's helping you identify who within your organization is ultimately responsible. If we think about what the question that we just had about who ultimately should be responsible for the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, usually that would sit in legal. However, legal isn't connected with each of those internal controls or transactions that we talked about earlier. Most of that will fall to your accounting and controlling teams and really could be in your payables. It could be your payable clerk and manager. 
It could be your time and expense or your uh, travel and expense uh, manager who are reviewing these. So it's understanding how you then proliferate this throughout the organization and how you effectively communicate not only internally but externally as well with all of your um, third-party vendors. So a lot of this content around informing and communicating, really, if you think about what most organizations do around the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, it's you develop a training program that starts with what is ethical behavior, you go into gift policies, you can define what government official is, and then how you extend that out and which groups to train should really be influenced by your risk assessment and your control activities. So this step becomes really important in defining and setting up responsibility and accountability, not only for the program, but for internal controls and then ultimately how they will be measured. So if we use a couple examples here, training education, awareness, accountability, we talked about this internal, external. One thing to note here is around frequency. When you go through and you're establishing and using the COSO framework to meet a stated objective, an important element out of this is understanding the frequency by which that program reports. To use an example, if you look at the SOX program, SOX has a quarterly cadence where through management's 302 certification, they're reviewing their internal controls and then reporting on the effectiveness of those internal controls. So frequency becomes an important piece as you're defining your program. All right, moving to the next step. Once we've communicated and we've let informed people of what their roles and responsibilities are, that frequency piece that we were talking about is the transition into the monitoring activities. So how do you adequately report on the status of the defined control activities? How do you, are you able to assess the health of the activities at any given time? And how do you timely respond to exceptions um, when they're identified? This is, your, when you look at your organization, this is your most important step in really helping. It's not just going out and establishing your internal controls, doing your risk, risk assessment, doing that once and then it's done. Really the objective here is that you're creating some kind of feedback or iteration process where they're constantly reporting up anything that looks suspicious or anything that looks of a nature that needs to be reviewed by legal. So this step really becomes important for linking all the other components together to check the status of how effective we are and how quickly we can detect and respond to any incident that may come through. So I'm going to pause there for a second. Hopefully this is uh, if you have any questions, hopefully some of this is starting to make sense. Um, ultimately, when you think about the principles, each of the principles walk you through a way of thinking through different, walking through what you need to accomplish for that stated objective. Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, or FCPA, is just one example that we, we use today that is probably impact every company and every organization has impacted it in some way or some fashion. There are many other examples that we can go through. And we have another example that we can spend some time on just talking about. We won't go through it in as much detail as we have here. But hopefully you start to see the process that this can, how the power can lend itself to more than just Sar uh, to Sarbanes-Oxley's internal controls over financial reporting. All right, so we're going to switch gears and move on to our next example. And this one's cybersecurity. Um, so many of you, uh, if I, I know that most of the boards that I sit on or that I'm involved with, this is probably the most, uh, the single biggest topic that they talk about. Uh, I just got a, a, a blurb here from the SEC Chairman Mary Jo White and talking about her kind of view of cybersecurity. This is certainly something that is becoming, becoming more prominent within organizations. We're going to use this, if you think about what we just walked through for FCPA, COSO provides that same ability for organizations 
to go back and use a similar approach, but looking at cybersecurity. So if you think about cybersecurity and what's intended, ultimately you're starting to see more companies disclose it in their 10K um, a, a footnote related to cybersecurity. Um, that is the trend that is going on with the SEC. They want to see more transparency around what organizations are doing. I've put a couple of bullet points here that talk about um, the intent of an SEC disclosure for cybersecurity. It should be noted that although there are no existing disclosure requirements explicitly today, there are many organizations that are including this within their 10K. So just moving on, a cybersecurity program can have many facets. Um, most of it really is getting down to how do you conduct a periodic assessment of the nature, understanding where your data and your information is, how sensitive it is to get um, kind of doing a data risk analysis, identifying, knowing where your sensitive data is, the location of where it's stored, understanding internally and externally what cybersecurity threats could exist and vulnerabilities, understanding the security controls and process you currently have in place, and how that then could impact um, the information and the systems that you have if compromised. So if you think about what the example that we just walked through uh, for COSO, if you took cybersecurity and you lined it up against COSO, you would start again with the control environment. So who would be responsible for setting up this program within your, within your organization? Is that individual knowledgeable? Is that individual ultimately setting the tone at the top? Then the next step you would go into, all right, have you performed a risk assessment using cybersecurity criteria? Where are we vulnerable or where could a cybersecurity attack occur? And what is the risk and where are all those elements? So it's really going through each of your organizations and thinking about what is unique to you and starting to ask those questions and line it up. Have we done a risk assessment? Do we know where they exist? Once you define through your risk assessment where those risks are, then developing the internal controls to prevent and detect any incident that might occur. Then it's informing and communicating and making people aware. And then ultimately it's about monitoring and understanding that when you are compromised, how quickly you can respond and minimize the damage to that. So without going into the same steps that we did with FCPA, COSA provides that framework where you can use cybersecurity as your stated objective and start organizing a program that will help you um, in really addressing what are your risks within the organization. And again, uh, just to reiterate the question from earlier, COSO does outline um, the responsibilities of the board of directors with respect to these areas. So starting with the board, maybe going down to an IT uh, steering committee type situation, and then down to more of the, the management of who's responsible, who's doing the risk assessment, who's responsible for the internal controls, et cetera. When you think about where, what you're trying to accomplish from an, or, from an organization standpoint, when you look at Foreign Corrupt Practice Act or you look at cybersecurity, or we'll talk about other examples like privacy or HIPAA or other things that might be impacting you, it could be that you have a PO policy internally that you want to be 98% PO compliant in your organization. If that's what you're trying to do, COSO can set up the framework to help you monitor and develop out the structure for that organization to effectively respond to whatever stated objective you're trying to achieve. That's really the power that COSO brings. Um, it gives you that visibility and it has those principles that lets you step yourself through and ask the questions about how you do this. Flipping back the other way, the more comprehensive you are in your risk assessment and reviewing against the stated objective, the more robust your program will become. If you think about Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, the more comprehensive you are in assessing the organization as a whole and doing a risk assessment and then highlighting those areas that have the biggest risk 
and working on them to develop internal controls and having a plan in place to get to the other areas, that starts to establish a very effective internal control framework that creates a situation that if you do have a violation, which hopefully you never do, that when you go and report, you can report all the good things that you're doing and how you've set up your program, how you've identified someone at the top, how you've done a comprehensive risk assessment, how that links into the control, control activities, and how that ultimately will then tie into how you're monitoring and reporting. So thinking through each of these steps provides a great avenue for you to really set up your organization in a way that can effectively respond at any given time to that stated objective. So hopefully that's provided some good contact, context. We're going to move into our third polling question here. And the question, I'm going to turn it over to Tanya um, for a few minutes, and then we'll come back. Okay. So when implementing controls around operations, such as fraud or cybersecurity, it is important that the chosen framework accounts for protocols and procedures already in place, allows for an easy implementation, can help achieve the objectives established by the business, identify potential risk and vulnerabilities, or all of the above. One thing I did want to say is we are getting some great questions come into our Q&A, but in the uh, objective of meeting our time deadline, we're going to go ahead and we'll save those to the end. And um, as time allows, we will uh, address your questions at the end of our presentation. So with our polling question, please be sure and press submit. We'll give this just another few seconds and we'll close those polls and take a look at our results. And let's see how we did. So looking at the results, um, it looks like the majority are uh, all of the above. So um, we're going to move on. I'm not going to spend it solely. If you look at this, uh, the question implementing controls around operations such as fraud or cybersecurity is important that the chosen, it, it is important that a chosen framework accounts for protocols and procedures already in place, allows for an easy implementation, can help achieve the objectives established by the business, and identify potential risks and vulnerabilities. The answer is all of the above. So yes, it does do all of those things. Uh, we had a question that came in, does COSO 2013 address the cybersecurity? So no, COSO doesn't specifically address cybersecurity, but it addresses what it does is it provides you the framework to ask the questions that would help you in assessing your uh, maturity of cybersecurity. I hope that is clear. I think what we're walking through is COSO provides an outline in a way for you to help stand up a framework or a program that can address it. So it asks you the question. It's asking the question specific to these principles and then it's you going out and into your organizations and identifying and defining who's doing that work and what they've done specific to COSO behind it. So good question there. Um, next, so moving on. I want to spend a few minutes, and this is kind of, this is where a lot of this will come together. We're going to use a few minutes to talk about uh, how, where you get started. And a simple overview in getting started is, really identify an important objective to the company. It could be privacy, it could be a system ERP implementation, cybersecurity and FCPA are the examples that we use, but it could be any objective you're trying to achieve. Identify that. Then the next step is assess the risk that could prevent the achievement of that stated objective. Develop the internal controls to address those risks or mitigate the risks of not achieving the state objective. Define policies and procedures, roles and responsibilities, and then identify someone within the organization who is at the right level who can lead this, who is knowledgeable, and set the tone at the top for the organization. And that really has that responsibility and accountability for that program success. And then it's developing, monitoring, and reporting to ensure accountability, and then timely assessing and reporting. So this is just a quick overview of an easy way to get started. The framework and the principles will help you back into 
those areas and give you the questions that you would want to go out and ask. So I'm going to quickly go back and revisit. We talked about adding value and reducing costs. So how do we do that? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here going through each point. I'll do that in just a minute. The important piece here is that if we effectively use the COSO framework to set up our program, then effectively we're addressing risk, we're defining our internal controls, we're defining ultimately who's responsible, we're defining how we report out at any given time, and we have the assurance that that program is effective based on the monitoring and the results. So to do that, and in putting this together, you really can add value to your organization and reduce cost by doing this. And I'll show you in just a minute uh, how we do that. So I'm going to step forward to our last polling question, true or false, the COSO framework can be used across an enterprise to address all operational compliance tracking. We'll give you a few minutes to respond. Weston, maybe you can answer a question while we're waiting for people to um, answer the polling question. Uh, our audience asked, how do the points of focus come into play with the principles? And you alluded to it just a moment ago about the backing in to that. Yep. But maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, yeah. So where the so if you look at under each principle, there are stated points of focus. Um, and there's quite a few of them. The state the points of focus are really they're they're kind of statements. The way I view them is they're statements that would generate thought thought provoking questions that you would ask to really tie back and make sure that you're meeting your stated objective. They're really designed to provide a little bit more clarity. Not all of them will be applicable, but they're designed to add more clarity and structure under the principle of what you're trying to drive and get to. So uh, the question, I think, was how does the points of focus come into play with the principles? Ultimately, the principles are really what you're trying to answer at a more, what I would say, at a 10,000-foot level, where the points of focus underneath them can be more specific to answering questions that could be unique to individual transactions, could be unique to how you are establishing communication, could be specific to how you're defining accountability and ultimately who's responsible. So the points of focus can be thought of as um, suggested criteria in meeting the principles. They're not required. It's required to meet the principles, but if you if you uh, meet most but not all of the points of focus, you can still be in compliance with COSO. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap up the polling question because we've got to get to the future and beyond. So majority here uh, is true. COSO really, the, the whole 2013 framework and the time in, spent to develop that framework was designed to address more than financial reporting. So a lot of the organizations, so COSO specifically said, hey, this is not just a Sarbanes-Oxley requirement. This is more. This can be broader. It can be all your other re regulatory requirement needs. It can be operational. So it really was designed to go beyond financial reporting. Um, okay, so let's get to COSO and, and the next level of compliance. We talked about how you can create um, an effective environment. So I'm going to start with just our COSO components. So as we, we've talked about how we work through each of these, control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information communication. We used an example. Uh, most Some organizations are familiar with SOX. We used our example of FCPA. And then we used our other example of cybersecurity. You can add others in here. We can put in a HIPAA program. We can put in a privacy program. And then we can put in other. Other really is designed to be that operational and anything else. It could be the PO compliance. It could be a new ERP implementation, and you want that implementation to successfully meet the end user needs, and you want 99% satisfaction in the rollout, and you want it to roll out on time. Whatever objective you want, COSO can help you set up that framework to manage that effort. 
once you start doing this, this is where the power of COSO can really start to take off. If you're looking at all of these in the same consistent way, then effectively what you're starting to do is standardize, align, and create consistency among each of these pillars. The next level, once you talk about accountability of people at the top, you're really establishing a governance model and monitoring and reporting. So you have people who report into each of these silos that ultimately will drive it back up. And then this could be the board at the top. It could be a committee within your organization. You effectively start to create a standardized internal control framework that is aligned across all of your compliance needs and it's consistently performed using all of your COSO components. Then your governance and your monitoring and reporting start to align up and come together. What this allows you to do is it starts to give you visibility where you could have controls that are really the same controls but design or maybe meeting different objectives. And by looking at that same control across all of those pillars, if you could go back and adjust the design slightly to address each of those compliance pillars and have one control, you now are starting to move into what we call this E2 of efficiency and effectiveness. Rather than having individual controls that are run in silos that are not visible to each other, you start to see where that commonality exists and how those controls are connected to one another. And that gives you an ability to view and change the controls in a way that meet all of your stated objectives and have one control while eliminating redundancy and duplication. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So I know I can't see people nodding their heads, but hopefully this is starting to come together. Um, let's take it one step further. What if we could take that model and then at any given time, be able to report out on what is my cost to run that, mod that program. So what if we could effectively know how much it costs to run SOX, how much it costs to run an internal control framework around FCPA. If you have the ability to understand the costs and the risk, then it would create an opportunity for you to make better strategic decisions. Maybe you're looking at implementing a new system, but that new system isn't as automated as it is today and requires two more people to do or perform that work and it's manual labor and your risk goes up. Well, maybe you're not willing to take on that new system because the cost is actually going up from a compliance standpoint and your risk is going up. So if you start to put these in pillars and talk about it, it creates a lot of opportunity to look at your organization differently, to make better strategic decisions, have a greater focus on risk and optimize that risk, uh, more informed considerations around new initiatives, better alignment of the goals, the company's goals and strategies. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. And it's going to really lend itself into a more agile approach for change as conditions that impact your business come forward. So that being said, we're going to take it one step further, and we're going to look at many of you have probably heard of enterprise risk management. A lot of times I've seen enterprise risk management come in, and it goes top down, bottom up. Well, a lot of times it really ends up being more top down, but what if you had all of this that was feeding and informing your enterprise risk management from a bottom up, and then you took the top down, which includes your strategic vision, strategy, and where you're going, and then you put your risk optimization in the middle. So the power of running COSO together here really creates a way for you to start to transcend into a more formal internal control framework and ultimately allows you to transcend into your enterprise risk management. So I know we're running out of time and I want to quickly just kind of, this is just reiterating, if you think about what we've talked about today, it can provide an increased knowledge of a state of a program. It inherently can increase the assurance that you give the C-suite, senior leadership and management, it can provide a consistent framework. It's The nice thing about COSO is it's scalable. And if you're effectively putting it together, you can start to see the visibility and reduced cost that can have a direct bottom line impact. So with that, I appreciate your time. 
I know that we didn't get a chance to get to all the questions and we'll get those answers submitted out to everyone, but want to thank everyone for joining for the hour and uh, hopefully this was helpful and beneficial. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to give us a call or reach out to us via email. Thanks everybody. All right, thanks. Thank you.